of two deliberations. <laughs> there it goes. Let's see. Yeah, well, welcome everyone to the first of two deliberations for our fiscal year 23 24 uh, CDBG funding. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jason Tamura, the chairperson for the Block Grants Advisory Committee. I'm also joined by our Block Grants Advisory Committee members who will be introduced in a second through roll call. Tonight's deliberation will be to hear from agencies applying for public services and capital project funding. No decisions will be made tonight. Uh, decisions will take place on Thursday, February 16th, and we will share more about that at the end of this meeting. Um, so uh, shall we begin? Uh, Rosie, could you please take the roll call? Sure thing, thank you, Chairperson Tamara. Okay, uh, Chairperson Tamara here. Yeah. First Vice Chair, Jose Aguilera Galvan. Here. Second Vice Chair, Esther Acosta. Here. Robert Doyle. Here. Patricia Solorio. Here. Angie Bolden. Tim Seifert. Here. Yvonne Teniente. Here. Audrey Bustamante. Here. Rosalie Marquez. Here. Isaac Peruman. Denise Martinez. Jennifer Camacho Tiburcio. Here. Ronald Jacobs. Here. And I'm going to repeat, I know Angie was not able to make it tonight, but I'm going to call Isaac Baruman and Denise Martinez. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Rosie. Um, uh, committee members, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from the January 10th meeting? And if so, do I have a first and a second to approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second from Esther. Ooh. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Ron Jacobs, abstention. Okay. All right. Thank you. Then the minutes are approved and then we can move on. So uh, Rosie, could you please review tonight's meeting protocol? Yes, thank you. Good evening. I am Rosy Rojo, the Community Programs Manager for the City of Santa Maria. I'm joined tonight by our Grant Specialist 2, Alicia Vela, and our housing and community services technician, Adriana Delgado, which make up the community programs division. As Jason mentioned, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to hear from agencies that applied for fiscal year 2023-24 community development block grant funding. This is an opportunity to highlight each applicant's proposed program or project to the committee and the public. Each applicant that is looking to obtain funding has already had the opportunity to speak to a few of our committee members during a private site visit. Each team put together a report of its site visits and has shared that report with the rest of the committee. For tonight's virtual meeting, each agency will have a total of three minutes to present their program or project. Applicants will present in alphabetical order according to their organization's name as provided in their application. If there are multiple people who will want to speak on behalf of one agency, they will collectively have three minutes. This is so that each agency gets the exact same amount of time as another agency wanting to speak tonight. Please be respectful of this time. A timer will be visible on the screen to show the remaining time. If an applicant is not available when their organization is called, we will move to the next applicant in order. We will call on the organization again as time permits or they may be moved to the end. Following each agency's presentation, committee members may ask questions of the applicant. 
And I believe we have an, is that the next slide? Attendees should remain muted for the duration of the meeting unless it is their time to speak. This is very important. We do not want anyone to have to com uh, compete with anyone else's audio when they are trying to speak. We are not allowing applicants to share their screens or play any pre-recorded audio or visuals. Once this portion of the meeting is complete, there will be a public comment period for non-agenda items. Commenters must provide their name, association, and purpose of their comment. Comments are limited to three minutes each and not more than a total of 15 minutes will be allotted for the public comment period. Agencies, it would be helpful if at this time you could make sure that you are identified by your name and organization. This will help us in identifying you not only during this meeting, but for our meeting minute. So if you can take a, the, a moment to update if you haven't done so already on your um, screen underneath your image, it'll show your name. Um, if you can just make sure that it has your name and the organization you're with. Next slide, please. And um, also, uh, Adriana is going to post the link for the Google okay. Doc to sign in. Um, so it'll be your agency name, um, your name, and then email address and any additional information you'd like to share. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, Adriana has posted that in the chat. And if you can take a moment to open that document and put in your information, that would be great. And I'm admitting a couple more people. I see Isaac Beruman coming in. So we have committee member Beruman in the house. Okay, moving on to slide number five, committee. Tonight's part one of two deliberations is only meant to hear from each applicant in a public setting. Decisions as to who gets what and how much will not take place tonight. During the Thursday, February 16th meeting, where the second part of this deliberation process takes place, the committee can discuss the proposed allocations and make its final recommendations that will go before the city council on Tuesday, April 4th. Next slide, please. On your screen, you will see the adopted city funded priorities that were adopted by the city council back in August of 2022 for this upcoming fiscal year. Next slide. Here is a summary of the applications. We received 24 applications for public services and five for CDBG Capital. And as you can see, we received more in the ask, ask, asking amount than we do in projected funding. Now, we don't know exactly how much we're going to get just yet, but we should know that in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, we are moving forward with a projection of how much we're going to get. So we're estimating that we're gonna have approximately 223,000 for public services and a little under a million for capital. Next slide, please. Committee, all members should have a copies of each site visits report. So when the committee, when split up, into set a groups of two or three and they visited your agencies, they put together a report that they shared with the other committee members who were not able to go to the site, those particular site visits. So they have all of the information that was shared by the agency to the, the site visit team. They put that in a report and presented it to everyone else. So everybody on the committee has that information. Should you have any committee members, should you have any questions about those, those reports, uh, please bring them up during the agency's question and an answer portion. At this time, do any committee members have a conflict of interest that may require them to recuse themselves? And this is not so much um, something that is 
pertinent for tonight, but it will be significant mainly during the February 16th meeting when decisions are made. Tim, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you, Rosie. Tim Seaford, I'll be recusing myself from the VTC capital funding. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions before we begin hearing from the agencies that applied for funding? No. Okay, let's get started. Okay, first up, Alliance for Pharmaceutical Access. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We will start the clock. Thank you so much for having us here today and for your consideration. My name is Anel Calderon, and I am the Program Director for Alliance for Pharmaceutical Access. Um, as some of you uh, might be familiar with our program, um, our Medication Access Program is designed to help our community members um, who are at most risk of not receiving medications because they can't afford them. And this might include working people who um, are unable to afford their health care premiums, um, our uninsured residents, underinsured, and a lot of times are elderly um, who are facing the Medicare gaps, um, coverage gaps. Uh, since 2004, we have worked with the community members to assist them in completing applications which are submitted to the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the applications are very complex. Um, they require a lot of detailed information, um, but they will allow uh, members to qualify for free or low-cost medications. We have found that because of the extensive paperwork, many of these uh, residents fail to qualify for the medication, and this is exactly where APA and our advocates shine. Um, APA has very knowledgeable patient advocates who understand the guidelines and how to work with the clients, with the doctors, and with the pharmaceutical companies. And our goal every year is to provide ongoing advocacy services and to improve and expand the services we already offer. So we'd really like to thank you and let you know how grateful we are for your ongoing support and for your consideration tonight. Thank you, Anel. Any questions for Alliance for Pharmaceutical Access? Rosalie. Yes, uh, what is the most uh, me type of medication that you provide or the drug companies provide I mean, is it mostly just uh, for diabetes and for heart conditions, or are those are the primary medications that uh, people apply for? That's a great question, Rosalie. But yes, about 70% of uh, the medications that we help obtain for this community are diabetic medications. Thank you. Uh, it's Ron Jacobs. Just uh, one quick question. As far as seniors go, can you can you give a breakdown on uh, the percentage that goes to seniors, those above, say, 60 years of age? Um, I don't have the exact numbers here, but I do know that they are uh, reflected in our application and um, ongoing reports. Um, but we do um, see seniors coming in, especially at the beginning of the year, who are uh, facing that gap. Um, and we are assisting those seniors in completing applications. And um, most seniors we are seeing are for heart medication. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, we will move on to the next agency. Boys and Girls Club of Mid-Central Coast for public service. And yeah, for public service. Uh, for Opportunity to Thrive? Yes. Uh, yeah, public service, you're right, I'm sorry. Um, hi, this is Emily Renault. I'm the development manager for the Boys and Girls Club of Mid-Central Coast. And we're requesting funds for our Opportunity to Thrive programming. Uh, we provide area youth with a safe place for out-of-school time programming, as well as mentors to interact with. 
This is vital now more than ever with schools cutting programs and services and children finding themselves more and more left alone without meaningful and productive leadership and or super, excuse me, supervision. Research from the Boys and Girls Clubs of America has shown time and time again out of school time programs play a direct and critical role in fostering the growth and development of young children playing a role in good mental health. Out of school time programs are linked to improved academic success with exposure to programs offered by the Boys and Girls Club of Mid Central Coast, such as STEAM programming and help with homework after school. Out of school time programs provide a safe and structured environment for young minds and have demonstrated a proven reduction in risky behavior by youth and teens who participate in them. We operate 13 clubs in Santa Maria. Another important aspect of our programming is mentorship. Guidance from a mentor creates a lasting positive impact on our participants. It's also a way for youth and teens to meet other young people outside of their normal circles. This teaches them how to interact with kids from different age groups with different skill sets who all share similar interests. For children struggling with classroom relationships and opportunities to find a place where they feel accepted is essential. Our youth development professionals who work with the youth at our sites are trained not just in programming, but also to act as first reporters. So they're trained to recognize signs of abuse or self-harm and more. We still are uncertain what the future may hold in terms of the long-term impact of our youth. And we believe we must begin now to tackle those challenges. We cannot abandon the children of our community when they need us most. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Any questions for the Boys and Girls Club of Mid Central Coast? <coughs> Rosalie? I, I have a question. Oh. Um, the question I have is that how, how do the students uh, obtain your service? Are they a referral or do they, I mean, how do you know who you're going to be mentoring? And also, what are the grades? The grades are actually, we just added a TK program. Um, so they go from four-year-olds to 18-year-olds. Uh, we have a teen, teen centers too throughout Santa Maria. Um, how they... Um, how they are referred, they're not necessarily referred. They um, know about us through word of mouth, know about yeah. family. Oh, sorry, there was feedback. Um, we're also in neighborhoods where we're, our, our big club in Santa Maria is on railroad. That's our headquarters. And it's right across the street from the school. And then others um, are operating on school campuses. And we have a good relationship with with the school district. Thank you. I see Bob, Tim, and Ron with their hands up. Tim, you want to go next? Or, Bob Doyle. Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> am I, am, who's going? Am, am I going, Rosie? Go ahead, Tim. Okay. So, yeah, I just have a few questions. You say you have 13 sites. You're asking a mentorship program. And you're saying that um, in the application, it says that you do 150 hours a month. Of, to, of mentoring. And I'm just wondering, um, where does this take place? How many mentors do you have? Does this take place at all 13 sites? It's a, it's a lot of hours. I'm trying to figure out the math. Thank you. Oh, I got you. Yeah, it's all 13 sites. Um, and many of them, like you're saying, where do they take place? And um, we've got our, our main headquarters, which is a dedicated club um, on railroad. Um, and then the the rest, the the other twelve are on school sites. Um, the mentors, how many there are? I I uh, apologize, I don't know the number of our um, of our employees, but all of our employees are trained in in mentorship. So so there's so there's mentors at every site every day for students to come in and get help and. Um, that's what this money is going to go to? 
it, that and just all of our out of school programs in general. So every single day, there's an hour um, that we call power hour. And that happens on all of our sites. Um, and that's where we have tutors and mentors, which all of our staff is trained in this, um, that help our the, the kids with their homework. And then there's other other programmings that happen. Thank you very much. Bob, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I, it really goes back to the um, <clears throat> to our team report. I just want to straighten out a little bit. It, it says the agency is working with this Santa Maria Benita district to implement KT and kindergarten programs. So um, you mentioned that. So I just wanted a little more information, if you can, on that. What are you doing with the take heat, um, the uh, younger kids <clears throat> and kindergarten? Yeah, so the TK and K, we just started that program this school year. Um, and uh, pretty much the, the, the same kind of programming, only it's um, designed for, for that age group. Um, but arts and crafts, um, other, um, I can't think of the word, but um, worksheets and stuff to help them with academic success and to prepare them to move on. Um, to their grade level. And we've found that at our, our places that um, our kids are usually right on track for the next grade level. Does that answer you. your question? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Thank you. I still see uh, Patricia and Tim's hands are up. Patricia, you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Uh, can you clarify um, how many 13 to 18 year olds you provide tutoring services to and then your hours of tutoring services? So the, the tutoring tutoring happens, it, it's almost as an ad, as needed basis. Um, if somebody needs extra hours, then we're gonna, I mean, everyone gets at least an hour a day. Um, uh, Monday through Thursday, um, so that they're they're getting help with their homework. Um, if if they're they need additional help, then they would get more than that. Um, as far as the number, I would actually I would have to get back to you because I I have all the numbers, <laughs> but um, I I don't have them broken down in front of me. I'm sorry. That's okay. I would I would like to see that number broken down. Um... If, okay. if you can provide that. And then again, if can you clarify what hours are tutoring, is tutoring available Monday through Friday and do you offer it on Saturday? So just the hours, is it like from three to five or three to whatever? It's most of our places are open until six o'clock. So it's after school. So three to six. And then um, some sites have summer programs and I, I can't tell you the numbers uh, for the summer because we don't know that until we get signups later in the spring. And, yeah. but we do have a summer program and we are not open on Saturdays or Sundays. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Tim, I see your hand up. You have another question? I'm trying like heck to drop it. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. Any other questions for the Boys and Girls Club? Okay, moving on to Catholic Charities. Is there someone from Catholic Charities? Okay, moving on to CALM, Child Abuse Listening Mediation. Do we have someone from CALM? Okay, we will move on to City of Santa Maria Recreation and Parks, the tutoring services at the Abel Maldonado Community Youth Center. Do we have, you. oh, okay. Hi, David. Hello, how are you doing? Good, thank you. All Just right. my mute button here. Oh <laughs> yeah, you're three, you got okay. three minutes. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the City of Santa Maria Recreation and Parks Department is requesting funding to hire a tutor for community teens in grades seven through 12. Uh, the tutor will be stationed at the Abel Maldonado Community Youth Center. So this is a center that teens are already coming to to recreate every day, Monday through Saturday after school. So we just wanna offer a tutoring service uh, that we once offered before through the state CalSOAP program, but, um, but we no longer offer due to CalSOAP no longer funding tutoring services. So we wanna request CDBG funding uh, so that we can hire this tutor or a duo of tutors to uh, perform a thousand hours of tutoring during the school year. And the goal will be to assist a hundred community teens during the school year Additionally, we'll use some of the funding to um, gift the teens school supplies and other tutoring aids uh, so that they can enhance their academic development. Um, as you already know, uh, the COVID pandemic had a detrimental effect on the education of our youth. And so as we see the national assessments and the state assessments on education and test scores for teens, we know that tackling uh, just the the severe impact that these test scores have is something that we need to get on um, as soon as possible. And we feel that this tutoring program will be something that can help with that. Although um, the high schools and the junior high schools offer tutoring services during uh, for an hour before school, maybe sometimes during the lunch period, we don't believe that that's enough of um, an aid to the students. So we wanna offer an additional site for tutoring in a place that teens are already coming to, like I said, to recreate and have them, um, give them the safe place to be able to not only recreate, but also um, focus on their studies as well after school. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, so most of the money, like I said, will be going to the salary of the tutors. Um, we will be buying some, uh, aids for the teens and for the tutor to be able to perform these duties. And I'm happy to answer any questions if the committee has any. Ron, I see your hand up. Can you, um, just a one quick question, can, when you're talking about aids or supplies, can you break that down a little further into what specific supplies or aids? Yes. Yeah, so for the tutor itself, it would just be um, sort of, uh, textbooks or guidebooks that allow them to perform their, their duties. But for the teens, it could be anything from school materials, uh, worksheets. Um, uh, we can pay fees for uh, a website, a software website that will help them to enhance sort of the learning that they're already doing and kind of catch them up um, to the level that they need to be. So um, that's the sort of thing I envision when we talk about aids and supplies. So we're not getting into things such as notebooks, Chromebooks, et cetera. Yeah, we they're not Chromebooks, but we could get into supplies like school supplies and stuff like that if if it's something that they really need. However, um, the department can also cover that through its general front. So we probably focus more on study aids and study software than those sort of school supplies. Rosalie? How many uh, students do you, you predict that you would have a day that you would be tutoring? Yes, yeah, so our center um, has 50 uh, teens per day, and I know some of those are duplicated. So our goal is to work with 100 teens specifically that we are accounting for, that we are keeping track and record of the times that they come in for the tutoring program. We'd seek um, their parents' permission to, to be able to be a part of the program, but also because we want to be able to coordinate with the schools on how the program is impacting their grade scores. So we do need a, their parents' permission to be able to access those scores and those, those test scores and those grade results to see how um, the program is, if it's working or if it's not working, we wanna be able to measure the impact. How did the students know about your program? Well, we already offered tutoring through the Kelso program. So some of okay. them um, were saddened to find out that we were no longer offering tutoring when Kelso stopped funding the program. But in addition to that, we already work with the school, direct, school districts on referrals for enrichment and professional development programs. So this is just another service that we'd be offering to the, to the teens that they're referring to us. And there's already a pool of teens that we work with 
through the mayor's team council. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh, Pat Patricia. Oh, sorry, I'm fighting with my mute button. Hey, um, so same question. Can you clarify your hours of operation for tutoring and do you provide services on Saturday for specific 13 to 18? Yes, we would like to offer tutoring Monday through Friday from 3.30 to 7.30 p.m. and on Saturdays from noon to 5 p.m. And this is only during the school year. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, David. Thank you. Moving on to ComUnify, it's our capital a capital project application for a safe at home minor home repair program. Do we have somebody from ComUnify? Yes. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good. Sorry. It's Hi, Kimba. Kimba. How are Hi. you? Um, good afternoon, good evening, rather. Um, I wanted to thank the committee for its past support of our Senior Safe at Home program. We are here seeking additional funding for the uh, next uh, program year. And I'm sure you are aware of the struggles of our senior and our, and our growing population. The Senior Safe at Home program makes the homes of seniors and disabled adults safer and better equipped to prevent unintentional and potentially catastrophic injury caused by a fall. The Senior Safe at Home program provides targeted, low-cost preventive safety measures, and that can help real realize significant cost savings also to our public health system. More than 95% of hip fractures are caused by falling, and the falls are most common of traumatic brain injury related to death and hospitalization admissions. The Senior Safe at Home program helps to delay or divert low-income seniors and disabled adults from hospitalization or long-term care, which according to medical health providers can cost taxpayers upwards of $7,000 per month per senior. The senior demographic of 75 years and older is the largest growing category of seniors served in our program. We have seen this group of seniors increase from 30% in 2020 to 43% in 2022. Santa Barbara County alone is expected to see a 118% increase in the 60 plus population over the next 30 years. What our team is seeing is isolated single females, 72 years and older with an average income of $2,200 per month. They are asking for nothing more than the ability to age gracefully in the community that they have called home for most of their lives. Thanks to the committee's past support, we have been able to provide not only needed home repairs, but an additional $165,000 in bill payment assistance and energy upgrades year to date. Again, thank you for your past support, and we hope that you would consider refunding us for, for the future. And now we'll ask any questions, answer any questions from the committee. Any questions for ComUnify? Right? Oh, yes, Isaac. Uh, yes, uh, do you guys do homes only or motorhomes, trailers? Yeah, we do all types of homes. Um, we also we primarily been seeing a lot of mobile homes as the biggest need because you know initially the construction of the mobile home wasn't really designed for mobility needs. But we do all homes, single families, mobile homes, and if applicable, we can do rental units as well with landlord permission. Well, what a trailer in the space using as a home, of course, is a trailer. Can you can I do that? I'm sorry. I'm, I could you repeat that? It's like a trailer, like a, it's not a mobile home, but people living on it, uh, like a camping trailer, but it's not moving. It's in the space, you know, camping trailer type of deal. Um, uh, they living on it. You guys do that? You so far we have not. We typically address um issues where a home is permanently fixed which I believe is one of the requirements. It, it cannot be picked up and moved, but um, we have not done any um, improvements to um, those types of homes yet. We have not seen that need really come up. So you have to inspect it first and then decide if it's uh, 
Yes, we do do pre-inspections. Absolutely. Because you do have to consider also we have to be in compliance, whatever, whatever the requirements are for the actual mobile home park as well. They are part of the decision process as to what we can and cannot do because we do need to get permission. Yeah. You guys receive applications through you guys or you have an, a middle agency to get applications through? Applic applications are, are, um, come directly to us. Okay. Ron? Thank you very much. Uh, just one quick question in regards to the these past couple of months uh, with gas bills. Have you seen a dramatic increase in people asking for assistance with bill pays? Absolutely. Um, it has been overwhelmingly um, large increases in application and requests, especially from our senior population, since they don't have the ability to really go out and get another job or really cut back on costs. They're already living as close to the to the uh, the grain as they possibly can. But most of the bills have seen um, on average anywhere from 50 to three times um, the increase, and we are being flooded with calls and requests for payment assistance. Um, we did recently read or um, hear there was an article in the Dependent anticipating February's bill to be a little bit lower. But in the meantime, we are doing insane numbers as far as I want to say we're probably tripling what we're doing um, right now for applications and processing and payment assistance right now. We're fortunate so enough to have sufficient funding as well. So when you receive those, how do you prioritize, you know, who gets what or, or how you how you process them? How does it get prioritized? Well, currently we don't have a wait list. We have enough staff where there is no wait list. So everyone gets processed simultaneously. But in the event that we get a wait list, we do have priority points associated with our, um, our intake process. Our seniors, disabled and vulnerable populations, such as people with ages zero to five, children with zero to five, they're the ones who get prioritized. But uh, currently we have not had to um, implement the wait list right now. We have ample funding, ample staff to process. Average application processing for um, uh, utility payments, if all documents are there, can be done in 24 hours. Okay, so forgive me on this one, but mm -hmm. I, I heard there was a lot of, we're, we're helping with seniors with uh, assistance with uh, minor home repairs and everything. And then when it comes to bill pay, uh, you're helping more people that have zero to five year olds in the, I mean, do the seniors get assistance on that as well? Do they not oh, yes. get the priority? Yeah, they are prior. So there's three, there's three primary priority categories, seniors, um, uh, families with zero to five and um, other vulnerable populations such as disabled or frail or, or someone who has any other cognitive. So there's a point system that's assigned automatically based off of the demographics provided on the applications, but seniors are part of that um, priority category. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for ComUnify? All right, thank you, Kemba. We thank are you. moving moving on to Community Action Partnership of Slow County, or CAPSLO, for its minor home repair program. Anyone from CAPSLO? Okay, we will move on to Community Partners in Caring. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Alejandra Enciso, and I'm representing Community Partners in Caring, the new Deputy Director. And we just wanted to start off with thanking you for this opportunity to apply and really highlight the services we provide for our senior community in Santa Maria. Uh, we want to extend our services mm -hmm. and do a campaign to, uh, to recruit more volunteers as needed as we're a volunteer-based organization. About 51% of our clients of the almost 600 clients that we serve are in Santa Maria. And so it is important that we, our office is here and that we serve this community as much as possible. And so our funding will go to uh, 
looking for more volunteers and for recruiting more clients that are uh, that need these services. We've extended our services not only beyond seniors 62 and over um, to people with disabilities, mild disabilities, or chronic illness. Uh, examples are we have a person with epilepsy or cancer. We can put them on our services and we provide non-medical, non-emergency transportation to their medical appointments to get their uh, to run their errands. We do grocery shopping for them if they can't do it themselves, or we'll take them to the grocery so that they can pr purchase their own groceries. We're even um, extending our services into a, some case management where we support folks into getting on Medi-Cal and uh, SNAP. And so those are the services that we're trying to extend into, into our current project. We're also started weekend services as of the last week of January, and we're excited to keep that program live so that our seniors can have access to services on the weekends, and so do the folks that need them. And that's it for me. Thank you, Alejandra. Any questions for community partners and caring? Tim? Yes, thank you, Rosie. Um, so um, last time we talked, uh, you had uh, mainly a volunteer organization. Uh, could you explain how many volunteers are, are needed to run the operation here? Yeah, so we use a volunteer ratio of one to three. Um, so, uh, so one volunteer can help three or four, even sometimes four different individuals. Right now in Santa Maria, we have about, uh, 45 volunteers, something like that. So we need more volunteers to be able to support the amount of volunteers. We actually do um, provide alternative transportation. We, we, look, we work with other transportation sources. Um, for example, <laughs> Air Connect does our ORCID volunteer and that comes through separate funding. And um, we have started to work with a local new startup called Kind Hearts that does transportation for our Santa Maria folks. Excellent, and how many is on staff right now? We have about 10 staff here that coordinate services and four of the, five of them are the ones that primarily oversee client intake and volunteer intake, and then coordinate the calls into the center to actually schedule the, the different um, services that they would like to have, and then our supportive staff, we have one admin and one um, uh, general administrative person that oversees HR and everything else. Very good. We're Thank tall. you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for community partners and caring? Okay. Thank you, Alejandra. You. Moving on to Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, Kada. Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteley, the Executive Director of uh, Kada, and thank you for this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about our mentor program. The mentor program is very similar to Big Brothers Big Sisters, which no longer exists in Santa Barbara County. One difference is that, as you uh, will see, CADA's program is very, very connected to the schools. After providing a mentor program in Santa Barbara for many years, CADA reached out to two local foundations, the SG and the Tobes Foundation, for seed money to start a similar program in Santa Maria. We are now looking for additional support to sustain the program and to expand the program going forward. You have our assurance, though, that CADA will always do much additional fundraising on our own to support this program. The mentor program is a prevention program that uses positive interaction and support to deter problematic behaviors in local at-risk youth. Mentors encourage personal growth, self-esteem, academic performance, and healthy family dynamics. Referrals are sent to us by counselors or teachers in the Santa Maria Bonita School District for students age eight to 13 or grades three through eight. 
The students are referred for various reasons, including academic IEPs, low self-esteem, lack of family support, poor social skills, et cetera. There is no cost to the mentees or their families to participate in the mentor program. All the referrals this year have come from Jimenez Elementary School, school but next year we will expand to all the schools in the Santa Maria Bonita School District. Mentors meet with their mentees for a minimum of one hour per week, and they commit to mentoring the student for a minimum of one year. Many of our matches meet far, for far more than an hour per week and last uh, up until and even through uh, graduation from high school. They can become lifelong friends. There is no certification required to become a mentor, but applicants are required to pass a very vigorous Department of Justice background check, live scan, fingerprinting, and provide proof of COVID vaccination. So I'm open to any questions you have about the program. Rosalie? How many students do you have in the mentor program? Uh, you said you're going to expand through all the other schools. And do you provide that mentoring program at the school? Uh, this year, we have 12 students uh, matched uh, with mentors at Jimenez. Uh, our big challenge is, as you can imagine, finding adult mentors. Uh, so that's an ongoing effort to, uh, we, there are no dearth of referrals coming from the school, but, uh, and we can match as many uh, youth as we can uh, find appropriate mentors. Um, and I'm sorry, what was your- uh, and, where, and, where, and where do they meet? Well, they start off meeting at the school um, and they uh, do that until uh, everybody, the youth, uh, the mentor and the parents are comfortable. And then they will go uh, offsite uh, into the community to uh, parks, to the Discovery Museum. Um, a week or so ago, all the mentors and mentees got together uh, at the bowling alley for a bowling party. Uh, so it's a combination of school-based and community-based work. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Kada? Tim? Thanks, Rosie. I um, just, I know Kada used to run the uh, uh, I visited at the um, uh, student uh, trial program. You guys, that 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 got canceled, right? Uh, student court? No, that that program continues. It uh, it took a little detour during the pandemic, um, but it's still uh, strong. It's also uh, uh, supported by Santa Maria Bonita. Uh, so, but that program continues uh, as a diversion program from the for the. Uh, juvenile justice system for uh, usually first time youth. Uh, CADA also uh, operates the Daniel Bryant Treatment Center. We're uh, really the only agency in town now doing uh, substance abuse uh, treatment for, uh, for youth. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Moving on to Domestic Violence Solutions, DVS. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ken Offlinger. I'm the Interim Executive Director for uh, DVS. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our program in Santa Maria. Um, uh, so DVS has been around since 1977. Um, our overall program is sort of backbone by our 24-hour crisis line where we receive calls both from uh, domestic violence survivors, as well as uh, calls from law enforcement and medical personnel uh, when there are emergency situations that require our assistance. Um, from there, we can bring people into one of our two emergency shelters in the county 
Uh, that includes our shelter in the city of Santa Maria that has 48 beds. Uh, we have two full-time counselors. And those clinicians provide services both to uh, the survivors themselves as well as to their family. Uh, we have a job and life skills coach that helps them with uh, sort of general job and life skills to ensure that they can uh, uh, get uh, jobs, they can address their finances, uh, and move on uh, to a better life. Uh, and then finally, we have a, what we call our Housing First program, where we have three full-time staff who not only provide assistance in finding housing, uh, but uh, we can also provide financial assistance, uh, and that includes deposits and up to three months of rent uh, for survivors who, uh, who qualify. Uh, our request this evening is for uh, funding to uh, uh, to support the uh, emergency shelter in the city of Santa Maria. Uh, this funding would all go towards the four full-time advocates that we have uh, on site. Uh, those advocates work directly with survivors who are brought into the shelter. Uh, they also work with uh, non-residential survivors, folks who don't come into our shelter but uh, require our assistance in a number of ways, and so we case manage their needs as well. Um, those coming into shelter come in for 60 to 90 days. During that time, we uh, prep them uh, for going on either to a transitional uh, facility uh, or into permanent housing. Uh, and, uh, and so that's why our program is as broad as it is, as it is so we can help those folks get ready for that permanent housing uh, and help them find it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you uh, might have about DVS or this program. Any questions for DVS? Tim. Thanks, Rosie. Um, so those four, full, are, those are full-time positions, uh, the, the four? Yeah, we have a total of 10 full-time people at the Santa Maria facility. Four of them are, uh, are client advocates, and that's what this money would be going towards is to offset their salaries. So they deal directly with the clients on the intake, uh, on, on all the programs, getting them the help they need, finding the housing. This is what this money goes directly for? Yes, sir. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions for DVS? If not, we'll go ahead and move to the next one, uh, Family Service Agency. Uh, Family Resource Center, which is a public service applicant. Good evening. My name is Cynthia, and I am here uh, representing Family Service Agency. I am the program director for our Family Resource Centers. And our Family Resource Centers provide intensive support to at-risk families to help them gain self-sufficiency. And I would like to think that for most of us in this meeting today, that if we run into a challenge in our life, we are able to access resources and support to overcome that challenge um, without too much, um, too much struggle to get the, the assistance we need. But for the families who come visit the Family Resource Center, that's not the case. They, many of them are faced with um, multiple challenges in accessing resources and supports. And some of these challenges or barriers might be uh, language barriers, transportation, literacy challenges, um, technology or technological illiteracy. So for them, they a lot of the families just need that little extra support and guidance to access basic needs uh, as well as long-term goals. So what we are able to do at the Family Resource Center is uh, meet every family where they're at in their journey. And for some families that might be accessing um, basic needs uh, such as food, clothing, applying for Medi-Cal, applying for CalFresh. And that might be the end of their journey with FSA or at least for the time being. And for other families, that is the entry point to ongoing uh, goal setting, uh, case management with our family advocates, as well as an entry point for some of our parenting classes and fatherhood classes. So really the path that any family takes is, is really dependent on what their strengths and their challenges are. And our goal is to help promote them towards self-sufficiency. In addition to accessing some of these basic needs, families uh, who work with our Family Resource Center staff uh, increase their resiliency skills and their protective factor skills. They increase their uh, skills that help them access 
um, other resources in the community. They increase their self-esteem and their overall well-being and decrease their feelings of helplessness. So really what, what a family might come in for one need, they um, end their relationship with us several months later, having access to several different um, services from FSA. And just to give a brief example, we had a mom who came in with five children or pregnant with the fifth who was um, parenting alone as she had been experiencing domestic violence. And she came for um, assistance with housing, unemployment, food, clothing, language barriers. And after several months of working with our advocate, they were able to work on those goals and are continuing to work towards stability to this day. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for our Family Service Agency? Rosalie? Yes, real quick. Uh, how many families uh, uh, the advocates help uh, a day or a week or a month to going through this whole process? Yeah, so any an advocate works with anywhere between 20 and 30 families a week. Uh, those are not new families every week. Some of them are ongoing, so they may be working with an advocate for several months. So there is some, that's not an unduplicated number. But if I look at our number of families who we helped last year with um, some of this um, case management and goal setting, it was 316 families. So that's an unduplicated number of families who received our more intensive services. Thank you. Any, any other committee members? If not, we'll move into uh, Fighting Back San Rio Valley, uh, which is the Youth and Young Adult Homeless Services Public Service Application. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Jason and the team. I know this is a very grueling process. So many uh, deserving agencies here with great programs. Um, I know you wish you all had enough money to support everybody. So Fighting Back this year is uh, partnering with a group called Dignity Moves. I put their link in the chat. Um, Dignity Moves is a large nonprofit agency who has helped funding a partnership between Good Samaritan Shelter, Fighting Back Santa Maria, Marion Hospital, and the county to provide 94 units um, on a county property across the street from social services. And so these units will be unique for our North County in that there will be single units per person. They'll have their own door. Um, 34 of those units will be for respite care from the hospital. That's why Marion Hospital is involved to get people out of the ER. And then Good Samaritan will be um, case managing those folks plus the other population. But Fighting Back will also have 10 beds for transitional age youth. And so today I'm asking for funding for case management for those 10 youth for a full-time staff person. I've raised some private funding and I need this city funds to finish that position to be full-time so that they can focus in on getting young people from that transitional housing into permanent housing of some sort. Um, we have office space there provided by um, the facility, but we really just need the staffing support so that uh, the young people who are there, again, 18 to 24 year olds um, who are in camp, who are living in our riverbeds, who are living in our stoops and our bushes uh, can go from that, um, uh, from the streets. We have outreach workers who are already working with them to get them into um, Hope, it's called Hope Village. Um, and then from Hope Village, we want to move them along into some kind of permanent housing. And so we need staffing to do that. So any questions? Ron? Ron. So just for clarification, the funds that you're asking for would be to help with staffing. That's one question. Second question is besides helping with homelessness or what have you, um, are you also trying to see about employment for them? Yeah, so your first question is for staffing. Yes, this is 
the the building and the uh, infrastructure and the all the security and all that is covered. So for staffing for the transitional age youth program only. And then yes, uh, case management means all those things that go into helping someone move from um, transitional housing into permanent housing. So if they are at all uh, employable, we will be working very hard to get them a job or get them job training around employability so that they can you know, have an income in order to get into the next set of housing. The next set of housing will require them to have ha uh, some kind of income. And so if they're able to work, uh, we definitely want to help them with that. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. And Tim? Yeah, hey, uh, nice to see hey, you again. Good to see uh, you. I, so this sounds uh, interesting. So that, then out of the 91... 94. 94 doors, 10 of those are yours? Yes. And so this money, how, how many, uh, how many, uh, what, what are we, what are we giving sure. these people at this place, Edwin? Yeah. So they'll get meals. Um, they'll be, they'll, they'll be housed. Um, they'll be able to be, um, unlike a typical shelter where they have to leave during the day, um, their unit, they can lock it and come and go so they can go to work, come back. They could work a later shift, um, keep their possessions secure, um, they'll be provided mental health counseling through Be Well. They'll get medical care through um, Doctors Without Walls and the public health department. Um, they'll get case management from us. They'll get substance abuse counseling through Good Samaritan, as well as if uh, they need it, they can go to the sobering center. But then our job will be to have that one person who knows, understands this age group to really facilitate all of those services so that they can be housed uh, successfully after being in the transitional housing. And that transitional housing is anywhere from six months to a year. And so um, for some that might be a short stay, but for others they may you know, need that long-term um, care because uh, it takes that long to get everything in place that they need to be successful uh, on their journey. And, and what are the ages here? 18 to 24. So, you know, yeah. a lot so of the, a lot yeah. of the young people that we're meeting, unfortunately, have either uh, have been um, out of the foster care system and are not voluntarily joining AB 12. So they're not opting into the uh, social services extra three years, or they're aging out of that at 21, and then they're unhoused, and they're not being successfully housed. And so we're kind of finding those young people who are pretty vulnerable who need this type of housing. And there's no sobriety uh, requirements because I, I see you're going to help for all this. So when they come in, they're coming in right off the streets. Yes, that's exactly right. They'll be screened and, and evaluated. They're not allowed to drop in. It's not a you can't just walk in and get a room. Um, you'll have been um, evaluated. Um, you'll go into HMIS, right, um, and, and, and screen to make sure that you're going to be a good fit. You understand what's going to be required when you're there. You can't have drug and alcohol on the campus. Um, you can't have guests on the campus. Um, you can't have a pet. They can have their pet with them. Um, they can have a partner if, if that's uh, appropriate for them. Um, but yeah, so there'll be a screening process. It's not going to be a drop-in place uh, like a traditional shelter where you can wait for a room and if there's one, you can get one. Um, you'll have worked with our team beforehand to get in. But you're right, uh, you're not required to be sober, but sobriety is going to be a goal um, for all of our young people um, as they are housed and, and have a safe place. You know, that'll be one of the case management goals. And how much on the mental health side are we going to give these kids? Uh, as much, well, the great news is we're partnering with Be Well, and so we're, we're very excited about all of their outreach that they'll be there. There's, a, there's another... Uh, there's a successful one that they've opened up already in Santa Barbara in the city. And so um, if you go down next to probation and the police department, um, and they've had a very good relationship with Be Well, and then the good Sam providing the substance abuse counseling. So I'm very confident we're going to get a lot of services there for them. We've also, you know, have a lot of interest from clergy who want to help do chaplaincy type programming. Um, and the community seems to be very excited about finally addressing some of this stuff that we keep seeing every day. Nice. Okay. Um, I had a question. It went right out of my head. Um, uh, 
Um, all right, I'll come back to it. Thank you okay. very much. The the link I supplied in the chat has a lot of frequently asked questions, and so there's a lot of great information there as well. Rosalie? Oh, I you know, just real quick. Uh, okay. So when is this Hope Village going to be built? We, you know, we <clears throat> we try to distribute this money for a yearly basis, Edward. Yeah, so, so the hope the hope is um, soon, <laughs> like this summer. So uh, we would definitely need the money this summer to to get started with the case management, because um, we have to go start screening people and getting them ready to be in. Uh, summer fall is what I've been told. Thank you very much. But my question is that if we're not able to to uh, provide the funding for your program, will this program continue anyway? Well. I'm counting all the people on the screen. Maybe everybody could give a thousand dollars out of their own pocket, and that would work just fine too. We take cash money. <laughs> okay, so that's saying that you will continue on with the program if we're not able to well, help you fund it. Yeah. No, I don't know that to be true. I don't have the money secured. I've raised quite a okay. bit, but I haven't raised the eighteen to twenty thousand dollars that I'm counting on the city to invest in this program, which is one of the only housing programs for this age group that I see being applied for. Um, there, Santa Barbara, the city of Santa Barbara has these services, but the city of Santa Maria does not have this uh, housing for this age group at all. The good Sam so will will open up the doors if there's room, but they're completely full. Uh, and so young people in this age group, unfortunately, singles, there's just um, Sylvia and her team have to prioritize the families and children, which she should. And so that leaves our young people fending for themselves on the street. So the Hope Village is provided by Dignity, not by you, not by you. Your it's a partnership between the county, Santa Barbara County. Okay. So Santa Barbara County owns the land. Okay. Dignity Moves is raising the money to build the buildings. Okay. Um, and then Good Samaritan will be the main provider of all services, and we're oh, partnering okay. with them and the hospital. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Ron? Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be a feasible question, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. <laughs> Can you give a, um, like, what's your success ratio, uh, say, over the last five years? That's a great question. Um, so of the 222 young people we've met over the last two and a half years that were truly homeless, that means they were living on the streets, they had no place to live, we have successfully housed 75% of those. And we are still working with the other 25%. Just because we don't successfully house them yet doesn't mean we haven't. We haven't lost track of them. Now, some of them leave for a little bit. They, they, they leave the area and then they come back. Uh, one, of our, one of our success stories who just had a little girl, he and his uh, girlfriend, um, he went on the road for about two years. And then he came back. He's from here, graduated from Rigetti, actually went to high school with my, my son ended up on the streets. And then he traveled, tried to find some other family members, but he did come back. He contacted us right away. We were able to find him housing at the um, Good Samaritan shelter uh, for a little bit. And then he actually lived in our other housing unit, which is a four bedroom permanent supportive housing. He was able to get his very first job. Um, out of that job, he got some sobriety. And now he has his own apartment that he pays for by himself it's not subsidized housing over on Her Hancock Terrace and like I said he had his he and his uh, girlfriend had a little girl uh, in November and they're doing great so 75 percent so far but we're working on increasing that Patricia thank you uh so uh just to clarify um if you were to be funded this would be the only city dollars allocated to this project that's correct. Right now, we don't have any financial support from the city for this major investment into our unhoused community. Thank you. Any other questions for Fighting Back, Santa Maria Valley? Thank all you right. all. Thanks, Edwin. Thank you. Next up, Food Bank of Santa Barbara County. Do we have anyone from the food bank?
Okay, we are going to move on to Good Samaritan. Now, Good Samaritan submitted three applications, two for public service and one for capital. So we're going, we have three separate opportunities since they are technically three separate activities. So we're going to start off with the capital application, Good Samaritan Family Shelter Rehabilitation. Are you actually okay if we kind of combine um, two of them, the family shelter capital and the emergency shelter? Sure. And then that way we don't take up nine minutes. <laughs> and that then I'll do great. a Okay. And then I'll do a fast warming shelter um, one as well. So good okay. evening. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kirsten Cahoon, Director of Homeless Services for the Good Samaritan Shelter. First of all, thank you for your continued support of the Good Samaritan Shelter. Good Sam is the largest homeless service provider in the county and has been serving this community for over 35 years. Last year in Santa Maria alone, Good Samaritan Shelter served 617 unduplicated of our homeless neighbors. Tonight, there are 110 clients calling the 401 West Morrison Shelter home, 42 of which are children under the age of 18. The Good Samaritan is requesting $20,000 for the operations to our Santa Maria Shelter location. This is such a small amount for the amount of services that we provide in this community. We keep hundreds of homeless off the streets every single day. These clients would otherwise be sleeping in the doorways of your businesses, the park benches where our kids play, in parks, in parked cars in our neighborhoods or in encampments throughout the city. Many have perceptions of who the homeless in our community are. Assuming they came from other areas or they're dealing with addiction or mental health. So I wanted to give you a snapshot of some of the clients we have in our shelter. Of course, I've changed their names. Jane is an 82 year old widow from Santa Maria who couldn't support herself on her $980 social security each month after her husband died and became homeless. Katie is a mom and survivor of domestic violence born and raised in Santa Maria. She recently escaped years of domestic violence but her family lives in low-income housing, so she couldn't stay with them. So she ended up at the Good Samaritan for her safety and shelter. Jaime is a born and raised Santa Maria native. He's 28 years old. His parents lost their home during COVID. They were able to move in with relatives, but he was left homeless and trying to survive. He works at a local auto, auto parts store full-time, but can't make enough to survive in our community. David is a seven-year-old tunnel school student whose parents became homeless when his dad was in a car accident a few months ago and they lost their income. Mary is the manager of a local restaurant, but her landlord decided to sell the home where, they, where she has been renting a room for the past eight years. And with her income in the high rental market, she ended up homeless. These are just a few of the clients that we serve. They're our neighbors, they're Santa Maria residents, and they're therefore our responsibility. Every year, Good Sam serves over 35 unduplicated clients across our county. Last year alone, the Santa Maria Emergency Shelter housed 280 clients into permanent housing. That is almost 40% of our clients exiting the shelter into permanent housing. Asking for your support is more than the $20,000. It's an investment in the people in your community and it's our ability to leverage these dollars to secure county, state and federal funding and to keep the shelter doors open and serving our neighbors. Our family shelter, which is our capital ask, also has been, that building has been here for over 15 years. And with the high demand of clients and the over 50 children at a time residing in our 14 room building, we're asking for some improvements to our facility, including rehabilitation to our bathrooms and laundry room, our windows being fitted for energy efficiency, new floors, painting, laundry room, and other rehabilitation to make our family shelter more feasible for the families and children that are living there. And our other application is the Freedom Warming Shelter. We recently, the Unitarian Society has been running the warming shelters for several years. Um, over the last year, Good Samaritan Shelter took over again on this project um, to run our freedom warming shelters across the county. The Santa Maria Warming Shelter has already this year, due to the inclement weather, served 152 unduplicated clients in Santa Maria. We begin this project in November every year and close in March. We open when there's a 50% chance of rain or higher or temperatures drop below 35 degrees. 
as we all know, this year has been activated many, many days because of the inclement weather that we've all experienced. We also had to actually open one weekend during the storms, 24 hour shelters in partnership with Allen Hancock College. We have been utilizing the Cornerstone Church here in Santa Maria for our operations this year. And we've had more activation nights this year than we had the entire two years combined previously. We're asking for support to keep this project going. The warming shelters are a no question asked shelter. They open at 6 p.m. on inclement weather nights and close at 6 a.m. Clients receive a warm meal, a warm place to sleep, case management, access to services. We have been providing transportation to the warming shelter through our outreach grants. And we continue to believe that this is a very important project in our city. The clients that utilize this service are usually the most chronically homeless and most service resistant in our community. So this is really an option to provide them safety from the weather, but also the opportunity for us to connect with them for services. We appreciate your continued support and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Kirsten. Wow, you did all three. That's wonderful. <laughs> any, oh, Rosalie, um, you have a, your hand up? Yes, I did. Um, I'm sorry to have my hand up all the time, but I have all these questions in my mind. Um, where do they stay when you have the, where's, I didn't catch it where the homing center is, the warming center is located. Sure. And this year we're actually utilizing the Cornerstone Church across from the Olive Garden. They had a very large basketball court um, size room that they've been allowing us to use for our activations this year. It's been wonderful. Oh, okay. And so you have staff that's super, there to supervise them, right? We do. We have staff. We have two staff members on um, the entire duration of the night. Um, and then we have, we cook most of the food over at our regular Morrison campus and bring it over to the shelter in the evenings. We provide clothing, hygiene products, and all of those things at that shelter as well. And the second question I have, because of the speaker before that, talked about the, the Hope Village uh, that the Good Samaritan will be in charge of that. So with some of the, you'll be housing some people at the Hope Village when it's completed? So we're very excited about the Hope Village project and obviously partnering with um, Fighting Back. So I'm sure the people that do utilize the warming shelters are our chronically homeless, most vulnerable folks in our community that normally don't access shelter. So yes, they are definitely our target population um, for Hope Village, um, you know, even with the amount of units that we have at that, that facility, though, the warming shelters are still going to play a really large role. We're not going to be able to house everyone in Hope Village. Um, we're going to be starting outreach soon and really be targeting, you know, specific areas throughout the city um, and really working on housing our most chronically folks that have been on the streets of Santa Maria for a really long time in Hope Village. Thank you. Up. Um, my question is on the family family shelter. Um, when you're going through your remodeling, I'm sure you have this all planned, but um, how are you going to relocate everybody? I know you've had trailers on. I haven't been to shelter in a little while, but you've had trailers there during COVID. Um, have you some plan like that so you get the work done quicker? We have. We just um, recently remodeled our bathrooms in the emergency shelter, which um, I thought was going to be like the biggest nightmare ever. And we brought in portable showers um, and portable bathrooms, and we were able to do it in stages um, in order to make sure that nobody was displaced. And that would definitely be our goal in this rehabilitation is to make sure that as we do it, um, we can do it in sections and areas. Um, and we have our overflow shelter there um, at the shelter as well. And we do still have RVs in the parking lot that we can utilize, um, but we'll just try to do it as methodically as possible to make sure that we don't um, you know, really disrupt the families that are in there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Tim? <clears throat> Thank you, excuse me. Um, so how is the warming shelter um, funded right now? Uh, what's keeping it open? Uh, where do you get your funds from? 
So we do get some um, county funding and some state funding for it, um, but it's not necessarily secured moving forward. So um, the Unitarian Society, like I said, had run it previously. And so with good, they have asked Good Sam to take it over. So we need to definitely secure funding moving forward to be able to continue it. Thank you. Any other questions for Good Samaritan Shelter about either its capital project or its two public services applications? Okay, thanks, Kirsten. Thank you. Thanks. Independent Living Resource Center. Hi, can you guys see me? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. So thank you. My name is Jennifer Griffin. I'm the executive director of the Independent Living Resource Center. For those who are not familiar with us, uh, the Independent Living Resource Center is a peer-run cross-disability organization. Uh, our headquarters is located in Santa Barbara. It opened in 1976, and we opened our Santa Maria office in 1971. Our services are provided to any person of any age with any disability and of any income level. Uh, beyond the services we provide and in the way that they are provided, uh, what makes us unique is our board and staff are comprised primarily of people with disabilities. Uh, over 80% of our board of directors and staff are people that identify with significant disabilities themselves and are best equipped to understand and provide services from a shared perspective. Um, a little history about us is that the independent living centers came from uh, as a result of the independent living movement in the 70s. The IL movement changed the way that people thought about disabilities overall. Instead of treating a person like a patient who needed to be cured, the independent living way of thinking put the person first. And it really meant that a person with a disability was able to make decisions in hers, or on his or her behalf um, and about the products and services that would benefit them most. Um, our CDBG funding, it helps us to cover the occupancy costs for our Santa Maria office. Services we provide both from that office and also remote, remotely as needed are benefits assistance, information referral advocacy, personal assistance, housing services. We do uh, emergency preparedness. We have independent living skills training, assistive technology, and transition services to move people back into the community out of a skilled nursing facility. Um, the digital divide was given a needed spotlight for the, um, the past few years, and as many people were suddenly unable to participate in life, sorry, due to their lack of technology or it being uh, unaffordable, um, we have provided 130 Chromebooks, uh, including technology training and low-cost internet resources to individuals with disabilities who did not have access prior. Um, we also have our sign language interpreter registry, and it continues to help uh, with communication access uh, for individuals who are deaf. Um, many things allow our agency and our consumers to remain successful each year. However, none of this would be possible without the support of our funders. Uh, we are mandated at the state level to show that our local cities and counties have investment in the work that we are doing. So without our local support, ultimately our state funds could go down. Um, but I want to thank you for your time. We appreciate the partnership that we have built with the city and we appreciate your support. I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Independent Living Resource Center? All right. I think you covered everything. <laughs> thank, thank you. you guys. Next up, Los Adobes de Maria. People self-help housing, Los Adobes de Maria. Okay, we will move on to the next slide. The next applicant is Maikop, Misteco Indígena Community Organiza Organizing Project. Oh, Araceli, with Peoples, are you there? Let's 
Sorry, it looks like I think they have a public service application too. So, um, Arceli, is that what you're here to speak on? Uh, yes, okay. Um, Araceli, uh, it's coming up. We we have it uh, under People Self Help Housing Corporation, so it's under the P's. So, can you hang tight for a bit? In the meantime, we'll figure out your mic situation. Great, thank you, Araceli. Okay, my cop. Um, do we have anyone from my cop? I know Anna was here earlier, and she said she had to go. Um, but committee members, she did say that she is happy to provide something in writing to you if you have any additional questions, uh, comments. Um, so if that's something that you would like for my cop, I can definitely reach out to her. And we don't have anybody else from my cop, correct? Want to make sure before I move on. Okay, moving on to New Beginnings Counseling Center for the Safe Parking Shelter and Rapid Rehousing Program. Thank you. Good evening, committee members and City of Santa Maria staff. I'm Christine Schwartz, Executive Director of New Beginnings. I'm joined tonight by our Safe Parking Program Senior North County Case Manager, Diana Suarez. Thank you all for your time and efforts in reviewing our application. We are requesting support for our Santa Maria Rapid Rehousing Services. New Beginnings has been providing rapid rehousing services in North County to house both veterans and unsheltered families and individuals living in their vehicles and on the streets since 2013. We have staffed an office in North County now for three years and we continue to increase our capacity each year. 35% of all homeless people and more than 50% of all unsheltered people surveyed in the 2022 point in time count identified their vehicle as their sleeping location. More than 70% of all homeless in our county are unsheltered. Unfortunately, we continue to see that number climb given the myriad and wide reaching economic impacts of COVID. Last year, our safe parking program alone served 34 Santa Maria residents and housed 13, including a family of eight. This fiscal year to date, we have already served 25 and housed three individuals, including a 76 year old senior. With your support, our hope is to expand our work to help more residents of Santa Maria to find permanent housing. Here to give you a little detail about our rapid rehousing work is Diana Suarez. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to share a client story with you all just to help you better picture the day-to-day -day work that we do. Um, in August of last year, I received a call from a young couple, Michael and Cynthia. They had both grown up in the city of Santa Maria and were recently evicted from their previous residence, which was owned by family due to a falling out. By this time, they had been living in their vehicle for about five months. They were both working full time and parking throughout the city at night, usually close to a relative's home uh, where they store some of these medications that needed to be refrigerated. When they reached out, they had actually already been approved for an apartment in town, but had been having difficulty coming up with the necessary move-in fees for the secure deposit and first month's rent. I was able to meet with them that same week, and it was determined that they qualified for rapid rehousing services. I also corresponded with the property manager on their behalf, and we were able to get all the required documents on their end to be able to financially assist Michael and Cynthia with their move-in. Within three weeks, we were able to enroll Michael and Cynthia in safe parking, get them referred to our, to our rapid rehousing program, and provide the financial assistance with the deposit and first month's rent, allowing them to move into a beautiful one-bedroom apartment. Since their move-in, we've been able to connect Michael and Cynthia to a local church where they were able to get uh, furniture to make their apartment feel like home. We've also continued to partially assist them with rent over the last few months while they work to pay off debts they have to allow them to be sufficiently stable once our assistance ends. And most importantly, they've been focusing on their health and career goals now that they have a safe and stable place to come home to. I'm grateful to be able to help families like Michael and Cynthia, and I want to thank you for your consideration in our request to help even more families. Thank you. Thank you. We're any happy questions? to answer any questions. Okay, Christine. Oh, 
Bob? Your mic is mu muted. Sorry, non-technical. Um, I was just wondering what what is the amount of people that are of the homeless in our community are living in cars? Um, yes, the, in the according to the point in time count in 2020, um, more than 50% of the um, unsheltered population is in their vehicles and 35% of the entire homeless population in the county. So um, I don't know what the numbers are this year yet. Yeah, but, that's fine. Um, yeah, so 35%. So, so that's kind of really a hidden homeless po population, wouldn't you say that? Yeah, it it is, and it's um, you know, one that's probably undercounted given given their mobility and the and the ability to evade um, count during the point in time count. Yeah, and they don't feel they're homeless too sometimes because they don't have a car. Well, it's a very unique population that's often um, a situation where they've they've met with a number of circumstances, either job loss or domestic violence or medical issues. Seniors have unfortunately lose housing after many years after rent increases. So there's, they're often, um, you know, homeless for the first time and so are struggling to try to figure out how to get back on their feet. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Any other questions for New Beginnings? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up, North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center. Good evening, everyone, commissioners and city staff. My name is Ann McCarty and I'm the executive director for the North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center. I just wanted to take a moment tonight to thank the commissioners for all of your work and attention to our needs in the city of Santa Maria. We often talk about how hard your job is, and truth is, if it were easy, we'd all be knocking down the door to do it. We want to thank you for the time you took to sit and talk with us during our on-site interview and for actually giving us some time to talk about our work. You gave us an opportunity to share with you some of our challenges, but more importantly, you gave us the opportunity to talk about our successes. When we look at the totality of our work, while we must be numbers driven in order to meet certain benchmarks put into place because of HUD guidelines, we find it hard to view people as numbers. Many folks come to us at the absolute darkest moments of their lives, expecting us to wave our wand and to make it all better. Truth is we can't, we have no magical powers, <clears throat> but what we do have is heart, empathy and an understanding of how difficult the path is. This past year, we assisted with direct services 415 Santa Maria residents with 1,865 units of service and provided approximately 227 programs to 5,526 individuals. Yet we touched those people educationally with 454 programs. Santa Maria CDBG funding allowed us to serve 126 of those 415 residents with 750 units of service. Last year was probably our most difficult staffing wise, but yet we persevered and I'm quite proud of the people we were honored to serve. The overwhelming majority of individuals we serve are low income and are crime victims, meaning our first contact with them is at the time when they're reporting offenses committed against them. Without CDBG funding, we'd be hard pressed to meet the direct service needs of individuals. More importantly, we'd be hard pressed to have a location that is both comforting and safe for those in crisis to go to for ongoing services. Karen Powers, my finance human resource director who's on with me tonight and I, and my entire staff, we thank you for your support and your for your consideration for funding for the 2023-2024 year. Thank you. Any questions for North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center? Tim? Okay. 
<laughs> um, so with all the COVID and everything that's been going on, um, as this, um, what's happening out there is, is, are we getting more and more uh, acts of violence uh, or as, uh, what's your client intake? What, what are things looking like right now? That's a great question, Tim, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, the work is very cyclical. I mean, we have ups and downs and what we've really noticed with regards to COVID, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues on here tonight would echo the same thing. It's not so much, while the number of people needing services has increased, you know, sexual assault and child abuse and human trafficking are, you know, th that remains pretty constant but what people need is more. So while we may have the same number of people or slightly a few more than what we've had in years past, it's what those five more people are needing from our staff. It used to be, we might have five units of service per one person, but now we're finding have, we're having 25, 30, 40 units of service for, for those individuals. That's what the taxing part is on our staff and our volunteers. Wow. Thank you very much for what you do. Well, thank you. Any other questions for North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center? Okay, thanks, Anne. Thank you. Next up is Partners in Housing Solutions. Good evening. My name is Alma Harmson. I am the Executive Director at Partners in Housing Solutions. And with me tonight is Sarah Del Hanover, our Contract Manager and Bookkeeper. Uh, I want to thank the committee um, for reviewing our application and giving us the opportunity to um, talk a little bit more about what we do. Uh, Partners in Housing Solutions was established in 2015 to tackle homelessness in Santa Barbara County. Uh, we are dedicated to helping people who are experiencing homelessness um, find and retain permanent housing through a network of private landlords. Our program was established to be embedded in a network of partnerships with other uh, service, uh, social service agency uh, partners. And a lot of the work that we do involves bridging the gap between the private and public sectors uh, to help people, uh, in, in essence, get out of the system and re remove some pressure off of the system as a whole. As a result, uh, in the years we've been in existence, we've housed over a thousand people and we've worked with over 200 landlords. Um, partners in Housing Sol Solutions receives referrals from our partners and uh, we match each family and individual with the unit or a landlord that best fits their needs. We serve everyone um, depending on their level of need and uh, identify the barriers that are keeping them from becoming housed. Um, we then work with them and our partners to ensure that they have all the supports that they need to remain housed and mediate anytime that they need our help uh, so that they don't lose housing and they don't end up back uh, homeless. Uh, one of the many things that we offer, the primary thing that we offer is navigation services housing related support, uh, tenancy training, budgeting, and we do regular check-ins. On the landlord side, we provide financial safety nets, uh, including incentives, a 24 hour turnaround landlord hotline to help with questions that landlords might have, uh, and so that they know that they're not going into this alone, giving uh, the population we serve a better opportunity of becoming housed. And landlords are truly the, the backbone of our program because they're the ones that are allowing us to uh, house our clients by uh, trusting in our services. Uh, we are asking today for a CDBG funding that will allow us to expand our housing support services in Santa Maria. And um, we recently made a decision to close our Santa Barbara office and move our headquarters to Santa Maria. So this uh, would help our expansion of, of our office in North County. Any questions for Partners in Housing Solutions? Tim? 
Um, didn't you guys um, close down in in North uh, South County because the need was so great up here that now now you're you're focusing solely on North County? Um, we're not focusing solely on North County, but the majority of our work is here. Yes, we continue to pro provide services countywide. Excellent. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks. Um, I, I should have been asking this question to every agency that uh, is providing housing or some sort of assistance in the city, but I, I'll, I'll go back um, and ask, but for you all, other than CDBG dollars that you may or may not get, is there any additional investment from the city of Santa Maria for your programming? Um, not, we don't have any investment from the city of Santa Maria for this program at this time. Thank you. And then if, if there's an opportunity, I don't know if, if anybody else who had the housing, has housing issues that you're providing housing um, or house or services for houseless folks, um, if you could, uh, Rosie, maybe you can tell me what the best approach is um, to have them answer that question either in the chat or later on after everyone goes. So is your, Patricia, just to clarify, your is your question, what other funding sources do they have? Or no, what my, other funding? My question is specific to the city of Santa Maria. Besides um, this funding, do they, is there any other investment from the city of Santa Maria for their program? Okay, what we can do is a few people have already logged off that were, on previously, but what we can do right now is if anybody who is proposing to provide some sort of housing assistance, if you can put that in the chat, if you are receiving any type of additional assistance from the city of Santa Maria or support um, from the city of Santa Maria, financial support, right, Patricia? Um, yeah, if you could do yeah. that and put that in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Apologize. Tim, do you have another question? Tim? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Still having technical difficulties. Thank you. No problem. Just wanted to make sure. Any other questions for Partners in Housing Solutions? Okay. We are going to move on to People Self-Help Housing Corporation. And I know, Araceli, you've been so patient. Let's try out your mic. Hello. Oh, there Can you guys are. hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. My name is Araceli Barajas. I'm an associate marriage and family therapist. I'm a bilingual social worker for the supportive housing program at People Self Help Housing. We serve low-income families on the Central Coast with our goal of homeless prevention. Residents on our properties have access to free confidential clinical case management and on-site care. Our team helps build capacity, well-being, personal resilience, and ensures residents to have the access to wide network of regional resources. Whether it's a bump on the road or a long-term pro problem, the supportive housing program plays a key role in the return to stability. For this grant specifically, though, it's for Los Alois de Maria sites, which is our low-income USDA farm worker sites. One of the biggest challenges that we have faced in our department was the COVID-19 pan pandemic with the unprecedented number of residents being laid off from work and increase of caseload to provide resident service, services for homeless prevention. I like to give you a small glimpse of what we do. I have a client who's a single mother who was a farm worker and she had no knowledge on how to nav navigate most state and federal programs. She went to the doctor and was pulled from work in the fields due to her repetitive work. And now she has arthritis in her hands. I was able to help her navigate state disability as well as work with the property manager to do an interim, which is a process to decrease her rent based on her income. During this time, I also helped her navigate CalFresh and cash aid while she was pending benefits from state disability. 
client is also illiterate and only speaks Spanish, which makes this process almost impossible for her to navigate alone. I was able to help advocate with her doctor as well to get her on medication and physical therapy. Thanks to me being able to advocate for a client this last season of field work, she was able to return to work with modifications, of course, and is stably housed. Something you need to Unique about our program is that we are able to work with our clients at home as well as in the office, depending on their needs. Thank you again for giving our organization the time to hear the amazing work that we provide. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions for People's Health Help Housing Corporation? Ron? Um. So my understanding is, is that the, the, the funds that you're looking for will go to help for um, staff um, as far as um, pay for staff. Um, what's the average that a staff member is making and would they take less if it came down to it? Um, I believe that my supervisor said that it was like about an average of 65,000. And I think so. I think we would take less um, because just the work that we do, it's super unique and we wouldn't be able to do it anywhere else. Rosalie? Thank you. Uh, so this is for one position? Yes. Is this is to pay a salary for one person full yes. time? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Araceli. Thank you. Next up, Santa Maria Valley, Meals on Wheels. Hello, my name is Colleen Sinclair. I'm the Executive Director of Meals on Wheels, Santa Maria Valley. Um, we're requesting money to feed those living on extra low incomes, mostly poverty, to help feed our community members that are in need of medically specific meals. We have over 20 medically specific meals available, and, but many of our community members are unable to afford it, even though we subsidize all our meals. So we're very, very pleased that the city of Santa Maria has seen the importance of making sure people eat right. And with the meals that work for them. Most people are requesting diabetic. Uh, we ha also have high requests for renal diets. We actually have a diabetic renal diet. We actually have vegetarian diabetic diets. So our kitchen is Marion Extended Care Kitchen and they are able to handle any special requests. I'm happy to report we have 72 strong volunteers. We went through a rocky point kind of in the last five months getting enough volunteers, but our existing volunteers were stepping in and doing subs. So we have a wonderful group of community members that are stepping up to help those in need of a healthy meal. And I'm just so proud to work with all of them the average age of our volunteers is actually 65. The average age of our clients right now is 83. So we want to thank you for your past support. And again, this is a very important program. The program actually costs $35,000 a year to run just for the city, no charge meals. Um, so we, we usually have to put in about a quarter of that. We'll, we'll need to fundraise about $15,000 in order to keep the, the no charge meals available. We wanna thank you for, our, for your past support and any future support. 
that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Ron, you have a question? Um, so I knew uh, of a person who um, volunteered, if you will, um, either, I think it was like two years ago. And um, when gas started going up, you guys were giving uh, gas assistance to those volunteers. I just wanted to know, would any of this funding go towards that? The funding is going to pay for the meals only. So I submit the bills from Marion Extended Care Kitchen. This funding only pays for the meals, the actual food and the delivery supplies. We do offer reimbursement because we don't want to keep anybody from volunteering. Surprisingly, out of 72 volunteers, I only have about six who ask for reimbursement. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's not full reimbursement, it, but we pay about $4 for each time they go out to do their route. That's okay, still available. You. Tim? Yes, thank you. Uh, $4 doesn't even really buy a gallon of gas anymore. So um, we have six routes. We have six routes. And so there's two, there's route two and four um, separated by Broadway, Broadway, Main and up. We have two more city routes, uh, Central East, Central West, we have two orchid routes. So we're not, we're not sending them all over. We keep them kind of working in a circle. And we also try to um, put our volunteers in their actual neighborhoods. And, and didn't you, aren't you on a new program now so that it makes it even easier for you to track and uh, locate and do your, um, uh, uh, sending your volunteers on their, on their, on their missions. Don't you Thank have a new you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Yes. Thank goodness. Pre COVID we're on a 21st century called zippy meals software. It was designed by a gentleman in Virginia that was actually a driver and it gives route, it gives route delivery in order with a directional map attached. So we, and it also has special delivery instructions. We have about 47 to 50 of our 85 clients that have no one else looking out for them except for us. So we've now made a code on our delivery sheets that says knock, drop, and listen. So we pay special attention to those who have no caregivers, no family, no friends. And in fact, we rescued a city client in November who had fallen in his bathroom. He was there for approximately 48 hours. Our volunteers who had been serving him for seven years knew something was wrong. And we rescued him, got him to the hospital and called his nearest living relative in Ketchikan, Alaska. Cousin Ed came down, he was here the next day and made sure that the city client was well taken care of in a proper assisted living facility. We were very proud. We are more than a meal. Yes, and you, and you do so with a very, very tight budget compared to some of our other agencies. Yes, uh, you we do. You manage your funds very well uh, to get this all done. I commend you on that. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. And thanks to the support we get because we really couldn't do it without community support. Well, appreciate what you do. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Any other questions for Meals on Wheels? Okay, thanks Colleen. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you all for what you do to make this possible.
Moving on to Savvy Health Corporation. Hello, I'm Erin Shugart. I'm the Executive Director at Savvy Health Free Clinic, joined by our clinic manager, Carla Jimenez. Savvy Health is new, and we're Santa Barbara County's only free health clinic for people without insurance, including those who are undocumented. In addition to providing free health care, we pay for the cost of our patients' labs and imaging, and most prescriptions cost patients $5 or less. Our founder is a hospitalist at Lompoc Valley Medical Center, and he previously founded the Slow Nor Foundation Free Clinic in San Luis Obispo, which has been open for over a decade and has seen thousands of patients. In the eight months that we've been open, we've been incredibly busy and we've had over 400, we've seen over 400 patients. Although we're located in Lompoc, a quarter of the patients we have seen thus far have been Santa Maria residents. Most of our patients are monolingual Spanish speaking, many are farm workers, and many have not seen a physician in a number of years. The primary care and other services that we are providing is helping to to keep these patients healthy and productive members of society. Many of them are working and growing the strawberries that we eat and maybe even the wine that we drink. For most, if they didn't have our clinic available, they would not receive preventive care, result resulting in unnecessary heart attack, stroke, uncontrolled diabetes, severe mental health issues, and the list goes on. In addition to providing primary preventive care, we offer behavioral health care, telehealth, case management, health education, and medical enrollment. Um, and for this project, our bilingual bicultural staff will work with the Santa Barbara County Promotories to do outreach. We wanna bring in more Santa Maria residents who could benefit from our services. And we're targeting the medically underserved communities in Santa Maria which are certain zip codes, um, striving to provide our services to well over 100 new Santa Maria residents without health insurance and enrolling a minimum of 30 in Medi-Cal. I'm gonna pass it over to Carla Jimenez for a quick comment or two. Hi, so um, I began at Savvy Health Clinic as a formal promotora, uh, which saw the great need for uh, medical assistance for under um, or uninsured, sorry, uninsured patients. Um, like Erin mentioned, uh, we have a variety of services that uh, we provide at the moment. We are incorporating dental and vision uh, soon to a part of our services. Uh, we do um, address mental health and assist with uh, local resources as well. Thank you. Any questions for Savvy Health Corporation? Tim. Uh, thanks, Rosie. Um, I just wondered, did you guys know that uh, uh, Slow Nor is here in town and they uh, have a mobile unit here uh, three times a month and are looking to increase that to four times a month? So I can speak to that. The Slow Nor's mobile clinic is only serving women. They're primarily in Guadalupe and they have very limited availability. In fact, we are partnering with that um, clinic. They're gonna be providing women's health services at our clinic eight times throughout this year. So we're not competing with Slow Nor Foundation. However, many Santa Maria residents live closer to Lompoc and or have family members in Lompoc. And the reality is they're attending and seeking health care at our free clinic. So you uh, treat men, women, children, anybody? Absolutely. Okay, because yeah, I think Slonoria is just women, South only. Uh, they, they, they do have a mobile unit here in Santa Maria, uh, not in Guadalupe, that they're, they're, they are coming here now. Thank you very much. Bob? Uh, I was just wondering, how are the people getting to Lompoc? Are you providing tra any transportation, working with the city through, through the buses that run from here over there, anything like that? We have been investigating transportation options. And if we had a patient that requested transportation, we would cover that cost. However, 
We've seen close to 100 Santa Maria patients so far, and they either get a ride from a family member, they get a ride from a friend, they've been able to come to our clinic, I think because the services that we're providing are so important for them. And I have to just say that COVID really exacerbated the disparities um, among the uninsured, and, and we are really focusing on health equity um, to make sure that everybody, regardless of any personal characteristic, has an equal access to be as healthy as possible. Thank you. Sorry, I, I do wanna include to that. Um, we do offer telehealth as well. So for the majority of the patients, um, they come in to their appointment into the clinic, but then they do have the option for any follow-up appointment to be seen through telehealth. Thank you. Rosalie? Um, just to uh, recap, when we visit with you, I forgot how do you um, outreach to the clients, the patients in Santa Maria, how do they know about your, your agency to go and get this service that is free? Sure, um, we have been doing advertising on Spanish language radio, as well as um, television, thanks to another uh, grant funder. Um, we participate in health fairs and the word is getting out, we've been, letting other nonprofits, many of whom are on this uh, call, know about our services and we're getting referrals from nonprofits and folks are calling. We, we are so incredibly busy. It's just unbelievable. It's hard to keep up, but fortunately we're able to on account of the fact that we have a lot of amazing medical and other volunteers. Thank you. Tim, I see your hand up. Oh, yeah. I see it down. Oh, no, yeah, oh. well, I, that's because you called me. Uh, I'm, I'm getting better. Uh, so how, how do you propose to handle this grant? If you're in Lompoc, the majority of your clients are non-Santa Maria residents. This grant is for Santa Maria residents only. Uh, it's difficult to uh, monitor and it has to be monitored correctly for uh, Rosie and Alicia. How do you manage to, to do that? Well, we do that through our, our electronic health record. And that is how we know how many patients we've seen from various cities. And we've seen a large number of Santa Maria residents thus far seeking care at our clinic. With this project, we strive to collaborate with the Santa Barbara County Promotores Network, and these are trusted community leaders who live in neighborhoods in Santa Maria that we're gonna be targeting. So they are out in the communities at places where people who are uninsured are likely to be, like at money transfer stations, laundromats, et cetera. Uh, that, that's not really my question. It, I'm, I'm more, more concerned about the actual logistics of handling this grant and keeping everyone separate. And so that the money that you get from this grant is only towards the Santa Maria residents because that's that's all we can do is, is give out money for Santa Maria residents. So you have to separate this from your other clients. Is that going to be difficult? Are you able to do that? It's not gonna be a problem. I've done grant reporting for 25 years, so I, I'm equipped to do that and we will only be using funding for city of Santa Maria residents. And that's why we applied. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you Savi Health Corporation. We're gonna move on to Slow Nor Foundation. Do we have anyone from Slow Nor Foundation? Okay, moving on to Smooth. Hello. Hi. 
Hi, Martina. Hi, thank you for having me. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Martina. I am the office manager for Smooth. I'm here on behalf of Smooth. Smooth has been serving the Santa Maria Valley since 1974. It was started with a group of volunteers who saw the need to keep seniors in their homes and still be independent while being able to have safe transportation. And from that, our Senior dial a -Ride Service was born. Our Senior dial a -Ride Service is vital to our local community. We provide timely curb-to-curb -curb transportation for seniors in the Santa Maria area. Our service runs Monday through Friday from 9 to 4. We schedule transportation for various destinations. For example, medical appointments, grocery shopping, senior centers, and many other places in the Santa Maria area, or even just to visit a friend. Throughout COVID, we were able to continue to provide service for essential trips, including vaccine appointments. Many of our clients live alone, and sometimes the interaction with our drivers and or dispatch on the phone is the only interaction they have all day. Some of our clients do not meet ADA guidelines and SMOOTH is their only source of transportation. Without SMOOTH, they would not be able to get to their destinations, including life-sustaining dialysis appointments. When our clients have to give up the driver's license, SMOOTH helps ease that transition. When they may feel they're losing their independence, securing this grant would allow us to expand our seniors' dial ride service. Our rides are only $2 each way. If the passenger has an aide or an assistant with them, we do not charge for that person. It's only the $2 each way, which does not pay for itself. A lot of our seniors are on a fixed income, income and are very thankful for our service. The senior dial ride service is supported by excess of smooth funds, public funds, donations, and grants that we are able to secure. The current economic environment continues to make it more challenging, which is why our grant is so important. It would help us cover the cost of fuel as the price of fuel has gone up immensely in the last few years. And I also want to thank you for your time. And I hope you have a good evening. If you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Smooth? Tim? Thanks, Rosie. Um, you guys have a fairly big uh, budget. It's over $2 million. Um, you're asking for $20,000 uh, for this program. What? I didn't see where it was asking for money for fuel. What? Why? Why aren't you able to fund this program uh, with the with the funding that you already have? Um, well, we get our funds from it's just a nonprofit organization. I mean, I did put the fuel in there because as of the prices have gone up, you know that's a big part of it. I mean, usually we would use the funds for maintenance, mechanical issues, wear and tear on the vehicles, paying our drivers. So, you know. The fuel is a big thing. I, I don't think they that we added that to it. I'm sorry. Well, you did have yeah. You've got you've got in there for travel mileage, so that 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 actually, uh, yeah, that that covers fuel too. Um, but but yeah. again, you you've got a fairly good budget. Uh, you I mean two you've got you're over two million dollars. Um, mm -hmm. Is going to help you, or what's going to happen if if you don't get this money? Well, we'll just continue to do what we do, and and just try to get, you know, funds in other places or we get donations or, you know, try to secure with other grants. I mean, the senior dollar ride, $2 each way is, is not very much to pay for seniors to go to their destinations and doctor's appointments. And a lot of them don't even know about us. Sometimes they hear from just us driving by and they call us and they're so thankful because you know, it is a good amount because they're on a fixed income and they're just so thankful. So we just try to do with what we have and what we can get. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's a very needed, uh, very needed deal. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you.
Any other questions for Smooth? Okay, thank you, Martina. You're Moving welcome, on. thank you. Have a, have a good evening. Thank you. Moving on to the Salvation Army. Okay, moving on to VTC Enterprises. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to highlight some of the information we provided in VTC's proposal and provide some additional context for those members of the committee who didn't get a chance to see the proposed project in person. Jason? Yes. Okay, um, you sound a little muffled and far away. Okay, all right. Well, let's see if we can get that. Plug in the microphone. that any better? That's better, yes. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Maybe I'd hold that away. Um, okay, so just thank everyone for your for your time tonight. Um, first, our, our proposal directly aligns with priority number one, identified by the city of Santa Maria for capital projects. Our capital project will address accessibility and service needs for the elderly and persons with mental, physical, emotional, and developmental disabilities or diseases. Secondly, a proposal directly benefits the City of Santa Maria residents. VTC has a long and proud history of offering services directly benefiting the majority of City of Santa Maria residents with disabilities for over 60 years. And during these 60 plus years, VTC has learned how to provide these services more efficiently every year and providing and provide, provide, provide less on public funding. Today, the majority of VTC's revenue comes from non-public sources. We earn most of our revenue through the businesses we operate to offer employment and training opportunities for persons with disabilities. Third, I'd like to highlight the quick pace of our capital project if awarded. Uh, we already fully control the location of the proposed construction and we've paid for the design and final engineering work. So there is minimal little A if we are awarded funding. Uh, design work was completed in December of this past year. Permitting and final engineering are occurring this month. Uh, once permits are obtained, construction could begin as soon as May and end in July if funding was provided. Finally, our request makes the city of Santa Maria a safer place for its residents with disabilities in three ways. First, while our facilities meet all ADA requirements, uh, the ADA requirements do not account for an organization similar to VTC. Our sidewalks, entrances, and egress points must be larger than typical ADA requirements. They need to be large enough, for example, for 10 persons who use a wheelchair, for another 10 people who use a walker, and for another 10 people who walk with the assistance of a staff member to use our sidewalks all at the same time. Secondly, our sidewalks currently regularly flood. We saw this with the most recent rains, and that left our primary sidewalks underwater and uns unsuitable for anyone to use. Uh, thirdly, a proposal will create two outdoor covered spaces to provide a protected place for residents to wait for paratransit rides. We just heard from Smooth earlier, so we have individuals out there waiting for rides. Our current covered bus shelter can accommodate three people who use a wheelchair, leaving the mass majority of the over 200 city residents who we serve daily waiting outside and unprotected. I'd like to thank everyone for your time. Please let me know if you have any questions based on what I highlighted or from our application. Thank you, Jason. Any questions for VTC Enterprises? Okay. Jason, looks like you covered it. Thank you. Oh, I think I'm, at, I'm <laughs> close to meal time, I'm sure. All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, before we move on to the general public comment, if there is anyone who wants to speak on general public comment items, I'm gonna just name off those that did not get a chance to speak tonight, just to make sure we didn't skip you, miss you, 
we didn't have audio issues. I'm going to name them off. If you are on this list and you would like to speak, um, unmute yourself and go ahead and speak. Um, Catholic Charities, Calm, Capslow, Los Adobes de Maria, People's Health Help Housing, the Capital Project, MyCop, Slow Noir Foundation, and the Salvation Army. Okay, moving on. Is there anyone that would like to speak on general, on a general item under public comment? No, okay, moving on. Upcoming key dates, this Thursday, February 16th at 5.30, we will have part two of the deliberations. It will be in person only. So tonight's was virtual. It just makes it easier for all of the agencies to be able to get together and share. But on Thursday, it's easier for the committee to come together and deliberate when they're in person. So we are doing in person only. It's going to be at the Elwood Muscle Senior Center, 510 East Park Avenue in Santa Maria. You are welcome to attend. Anyone is welcome to attend. It's open to the public. However, you will not be able to speak in regards to the CDBG funding process. Tonight was the night. As of Thursday, it will just be an opportunity for the Block Grants Advisory Committee to deliberate and come up with the recommendations that will go before the City Council. That recommendation will go to the City Council on Tuesday, April 4th at 5.30 and that's at City Hall, 110 East Cook Street in Santa Maria. Any questions before we adjourn the meeting? Will the recommendations be public? Yes. The deliberations is all, everything is done publicly, so the deliberations will be public, and then we will put together a report and that report will go to the city council and all of that is public. And then the public hearing before the city council, that will be an opportunity for an agency to go speak before the city council to either support or not support the recommendations by the committee. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you, I know it's been a long night. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it very much. We appreciate everything you do. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us. If you have any other questions uh, leading up to Thursday's meeting, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Jason, Good would night. you like to adjourn the meeting? Sure. Thank you again for facilitating all of this, Rosie. We appreciate you. And I will adjourn the meeting at 7.48 p.m. Good night. Thank you. Thank See you. you Thursday. Good night. Bye. 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 B